thank you very much for, for the invitation to share some thoughts with you uh, on a topic that I had to really mull over. Economy 4.0, Mike, I'm not sure what that is. The global revolution, urbanization, digital transformation, and what it means for South Africa. Now, I don't have the expertise in all of these matters. But uh, let me first greet uh, Mr. Schussler, and I can confirm that most of the things I heard are truthful uh, <laughs> and pretty much on the mark. The leadership of the convocation and, and yourselves as part of the university community. Um, for me, what Economy 4.0 I is about is to say, are they getting help? I was for the live streaming. Oh, OK. I beg your pardon. I told you technology takes over. <laughs> um, what it means is, what, are, what lessons are we learning from the last five or 10 years of developments uh, globally and uh, within our own country and continent? A and what are these general patterns that we need to actually take note of? And how do we interpret them uh, in, in respect of our own uh, challenges and opportunities in, in the South African context? And then we'll, we'll try and address some of the issues that you've talked about uh, in, in, in the title. The first is that all of us have glorified globalization uh, over the past 20 years or so. And what's coming through very clearly in the last few years is that whilst there are many positive aspects of globalization, such as communication, the interconnections, uh, the interrelationships, the more connected world that we actually live in, uh, additional uh, trade uh, and the openness of that trade, uh, the exchange of technology and the movement of that technology, although much of it in terms of the benefits of that technology still accrue to a few uh, parts of the world, there's a flip side to globalization that has suddenly come to the fore. And the flip side of that globalization uh, phenomenon is that firstly, there's a realization as uh, one of the econ leading economists, uh, Danny Roderick points out, that globalization has actually resulted in winners and losers. And that greater note needs to be taken of who are the winners and uh, what percentage of a population do they constitute and who are the losers. And the winners and losers are both across countries in the globe, but they also within countries as, as well. Now, if you want examples of, of the losers and what happens uh, when they realize that they are losing out, then I think uh, Mr. Schussler was pointing out something about uh, the United States and the outcome of the elections, France and the recent outcome of those elections, Brexit and what is happening there, Watch Hungary when the elections take place there fairly soon, uh, and other parts of Europe as well. The losers uh, are beginning to realize uh, that in many instances, their incomes have been static for many years. That whilst the upper 1%, 10%, define it as you want, have been accumulating more of the national income and global income, uh, what you find is that the middle classes in the United States, for example, or even in uh, developed countries like Britain, uh, in fact have static incomes. And so the gap between the winners and the losers, both within a country and across the globe, uh, increases quite phenomenally. Secondly, that while open trade has uh, been a good phenomenon, uh, globally speaking, Trade uh, on a non-restricted basis has also uh, meant that there are winners and losers. So dominant and stronger countries are able to get better deals out of trade negotiations, and weaker countries often don't have the kind of bargaining power that they require. The mitigating factor here is that you have organizations like the World Trade Organization, which try to create a, a set of minimum norms according to which global trade actually occurs. But as you can see, notwithstanding those global norms, you can have political leaders emerging in different parts of the world who suddenly come on, on, on stream, so to speak, and say, I want to change the rules. 
So, you've had indications of uh, NAFTA. How many of you are familiar with NAFTA? I just have to keep checking that you're awake and uh, listening, you know. <laughs> How many of you had heard of NAFTA? One. You, what's happening in UJ? Okay, so this is the North American Free Trade Association, Canada, United States, and Mexico. And you might have heard over the last week that Mr. Trump, the new President of the United States, has said, I want to renegotiate these terms, and I want a different set of rules. And those rules must actually start benefiting America more, and less so my two neighbors. But secondly, uh, whilst trade has played an important part in lifting uh, many countries, economically speaking, and their populations as well, it has not necessarily delivered the development dividend that many thought that it might. And so there's some new thinking going on, part of which is, uh, could swing in the wrong direction, which is uh, what you're seeing in some countries, which says we're going to close our borders. Uh, if you want to enter my uh, country with your product, well, pay an uh, import tax or export tax, whichever way you actually see it. Uh, and then, of course, after making those announcements, you suddenly realize, whoops, if I actually impose this tax, it's my own consumers who are going to pay more. So if you noticed two months ago, the export tax was very popular. Now you don't actually hear about it because uh, consumers, I think, have begun to send a message in the right direction to say, what you want to do is not necessarily for our own benefit. But perhaps the most serious consequence of globalization has been uh, in, in pursuing productivity and greater competitiveness, you've actually had technology coming to the fore, moving across the production systems in the globe, and job losses becoming a serious problem. One of the articles I read uh, on my way here said that in a period of about 17 years, uh, over, what, a million jobs were, were lost uh, in the United States alone. Now, this phenomenon is going to become a multiplying phenomenon as we go into the future. We're more, and so one of the questions here is the digital transformation. So we can applaud uh, lots of uh, the interventions that come from the technology world until, uh, I don't know, how many of you are lecturers here? All right, so when robots take over your job using artificial intelligence, uh, then we're in serious trouble, am I right? <laughs> Um, so already, uh, I was speaking to some lawyers the other day, and you might have noticed that the basic paperwork that lawyers would do, drafting a will or a particular kind of simple contract, is now being done by artificial intelligence-driven machines. The, the first level of lawyer is no, lo no longer required in, in, many, in many parts of the world. And that's going to become an increasing phenomenon. So loss of jobs. And jobs as we know it today is not going to be the jobs as we're going to know in 20 years' time. So what does that mean? It means that, uh, as many are beginning to suggest, we've got to reconceptualize what a social safety net means. We've got to actually put in place, as societies and as economies, and perhaps even as the globe, new kinds of social safety nets, which will ensure that people who are not just poor, but who, who are able, willing, educated, trained, but can't get a job, can actually still receive an income. So some of you might remember that even in our own country, some 15 years ago or so, we had a big debate about a basic income grant. Now some of the most conservative economic uh, newspapers in the world, like The Economist magazine, about a year ago, we have already been arguing that we'll have to conceive of a world where technology, robotics, and artificial intelligence become so dominant that people just won't get their normal jobs as we know them today, but you'll have to give them some kind of income. The question is, if, if rich people and big companies are evading or avoiding or aggressively avoiding tax uh, or live in multiple jurisdictions and as a result of which they pay tax no, nowhere at, at the end of the day, where is the fiscal capacity going to come from into the future? In other words, where does the revenue come from in order to provide this additional kind of uh, protection that we're actually talking about? So there's a lot of rethinking to do 
in terms of globalization, its positive effects, its negative effects, and how we mitigate those, those negative effects. Similarly, the digital revolution is soon going to uh, allow you to dream and sleep and catch a nap while a car takes you somewhere. Uh, amongst many other things, you know, cook, cook, cook your next meal for you, and like I said, deliver your lecture as well. And so the combination of robotics, art artificial intelligence, and other forms of technological developments will be great at one level, but will come with challenges on, on, on the other hand. And the question is, uh, firstly, who benefits from these technological developments? Uh, in other words, uh, you, you'll find that technology development and innovation is still concentrated in a few parts of the world. Uh, continents like the African continent and many countries on the African continent don't quite have the capability yet to catch up with that phenomenon, although uh, several countries have interesting forms of innovation and uh, commitments to research and development that are taking place. Uh, but the digital revolution is itself going to create a new set of both opportunities and challenges as we actually go. So what does that mean in terms of the economic models that we're going to operate with in the future is the question that actually emerges. And perhaps the economics that we teach or learn in about five to 10 years time is going to be very different in terms of the normal conventions that we actually use to. The third phenomenon is, is global governance. We've moved through a period where multilateralism was a dominant way of, of doing business, if you like, in the globe, sitting down at the United Nations, at the G20 or the WTO, and working through uh, and slogging at finding compromises that will give us a baseline deal amongst all, of, all or most of the important countries in the world, like we had on the climate change issue as well, was becoming a governance culture, globally speaking. But increasingly, there's a tension that's beginning to arise between globally determined bottom lines, if you like, and what nations consider to be in their own interest. And again, there's this new thinking and writing going uh, in this direction about what can be determined on a global basis versus what each country's citizens want to determine in their own right. And how this tension plays out uh, is going to be an, an interesting challenge as we look into the next 10 years or so. The fourth is what you see a lot of at the moment is the geopolitics. Uh, at one stage, we thought we were living in a, a bipolar world, then a unipolar world, then we're now in a multipolar world. Uh, but that even in multipolarity is being disrupted because we're going back to the days where some form of duality in power, in military strength, and in political uh, influence, if you like to call it that, uh, is beginning to reappear on the global stage. So you can see with uh, Mr. Trump's first uh, visit overseas, the kind of leanings and biases that are beginning to actually emerge. And the question for all of us is, where does this leave us as a globe? Uh, where, where do we actually seek peace versus where do others want to create war and tension? And who wants to benefit out of war and tension uh, at, at, at the end of it all? So are there some very narrow interests that are being pursued? Uh, in the old days, activists would have talked about the military industrial complex. So are we returning to the military industrial complex in a new form so that more arms can be sold uh, because there's more conflict to actually generate and from which to actually benefit? So I'm sure at the university there are many who would like to apply their minds uh, to this particular question and tell us where, where the geopolitics is likely to actually take us. But one of the consequences of geopolitics and its current mode is the instability that it creates, the global uncertainty it creates, the unpredictability of the environment in which we actually live in, and the pure and sheer misery that is uh, forced upon millions of women and children in particular and older people, as you see on your TV screens every day, uh, when people have to march barefooted from one country to another, live in, in a very cold climate as uh, they have over the past few months, and at the same time, 
uh, be the subject of xenophobic and other forms uh, of attack as, as, as well. The fifth element is arising from all of this. We have <coughs> a growing number of people who find themselves marginalized and, 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 and in despair in some ways. People who are either within the traditional middle classes in the developed country or the poor working class and the lower middle classes in the, in the developing countries. And they are being bypassed by all of these developments. They are not uh, uh, beneficiaries in, in a net sense uh, of the kind of economic and technological advances that are actually taking place. And there's a number of writings by Joe Stiglitz and others which begin to indicate that uh, whilst, and, and, and there are those who would defend, if you like, the current mode uh, and trajectory of economic development by saying, you see, the world today is much better than 20 years ago. That if you look at uh, per capita income across the board, uh, it looks a lot better than 20 years ago. That is actually true because humanity has actually moved. But within a, a different uh, uh, country situation, you're actually going to find uh, that somewhere after World War II, uh, according to what I read, I'm no authority on this, so I'm just quoting, uh, what has actually happened is that that rapid growth in, and, and movement towards convergence in incomes is now becoming divergence in incomes, uh, particularly in the last 20 years or 30 years. In other words, there's greater inequality now than we had uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And so you've heard about Professor Piketty, uh, another famous economist who came across uh, my reading is uh, somebody who passed away recently, Tony Atkinson, who's done a lot of work on public finances and, and on the question of inequality as well. And in an interesting way, as we go into the future, and this is uh, for our university audience, uh, people like Tony Atkinson and so on would actually argue that inequality should be at the center of future policy making uh, and, and build all of your policy frameworks around how do you solve the problem of inequality, both within a country and across the globe as, as well. But what all of this inequality and the skewed benefits of globalization is actually demonstrating is what we're beginning to see in, in South Africa as well. And that is what I want to call extractive state capture or extractive capture. In other words, rent, as the economists will call it, is being captured by the few at the expense of the many, but far more dangerously, what we also are having is a capture of key institutions uh, in, in the state machinery, which either uh, helps you to influence policy direction so that it benefits a few, or it in fact ensures that a small uh, click can actually uh, extract, in our case, billions of rands without being noticed too much, but I'm sure you're noticing it <laughs> from the smiles I can see. Uh, and, and the national resources are in fact uh, being utilized for the benefit of the few. Uh, today, for example, the topic of illicit flows has become uh, very popular. But illicit flows arise from illicit extraction. And illicit extraction arises from the ability to actually, through politicians, gain control over or significant influence over uh, key institutions, be they enforcement institutions within the state or state-owned entities within the state uh, or other enterprises as well, from which you and I have uh, no participation. Uh, by virtue of law or anything else, or rights of citizens, but uh, you can have this little click uh, continuing to benefit uh, in, in its own right. Now, whilst we think we, you know, we can commiserate with each other about state capture in South Africa, you also see the same kind of policy capture or attempts at policy capture on a much larger scale elsewhere as well. So with the recent uh, uh, American elections and the results thereof, uh, the post-2008 work done in terms of financial regulation to make sure that the too-big-to-fail phenomenon is brought under control, that new capital and other requirements are put 
uh, on, on the heads of banks so that they actually behave themselves better. And the kind of recession that we saw uh, post the 2008-9 financial crisis in the United States uh, doesn't hit the world again, uh, are all going to be attempted to be reversed now, yeah, either partially or entirely. So you, some of you might be familiar with the Dodd-Frank Act. How many of you are? This is, in a, this, this is taking place in, in a university, eh? <laughs> so I can ask questions. Do you know the Dodd-Frank Act? So the Dodd-Frank Act was the new piece of legislation which the United States uh, legislative bodies passed uh, through the work of the Obama administration to create a new regulatory framework for the financial sector generally and banks in particular so that we don't have a repeat of the crisis that we saw in 2007, 2008, when you had banks like Bear Stearns collapse, Lehman Brothers collapse, the Bank of America buying off other banks, and so on and so on. Now, what uh, the wilder elements of the West, so to speak, want to see is a reversal of some of those regulatory provisions that have been put in place so that they can go back to some of the bad habits, make excessive profits, have high bonuses and salaries paid to themselves, and they wouldn't care whether that results five years from now in yet another crisis. So once again, uh, elites attempt to get away with whatever they think they can actually get away. The seventh phenomenon arising from all of this is the new forms of both left and right populism that you see uh, emerging in the world. You saw both brands of populism in the recent French elections, you had the so-called extreme left on the one hand, that did pretty well actually, 19% uh, in the overall, in the, in the first round of, of the elections. And you saw the right uh, getting, what, 21% or something like that as, as well. Uh, and eventually getting close to, what, 40% uh, in the second round of the French elections. Now what's the significance of this? The significance of this is that when people are finding themselves in a situation where they don't see hope for the future, they don't see themselves as beneficiaries of all this fancy stuff that's going around them, uh, and they are uncertain about their own future, they see migrants coming across the border, uh, allegedly taking their jobs or uh, taking the opportunities that their social welfare systems have, have to actually offer, <coughs> Uh, we then see uh, the population <coughs> turning against the migrants and looking for quick answers and promises that in fact might never be fulfilled. And then you can generate all kinds of the wrong emotions in, in a longer term sense, uh, which are negative for that society, but also negative for the kind of progressive world we want to see where there's new forms of integration, new forms of harmony, less conflict, less of the enforced migration that you see happening in many parts of the world. And those political decisions that are made then introduce, as they have in certain countries in Europe already, uh, new forms or new organizations that reproduce some of the old tendencies that were seen in Europe in the 1930s and 40s. So there are more neo-Nazi parties in Europe today than 10 years ago, for example. Um, and so that brand of, of politics then in begins to infect society and the kind of decisions that those societies make as well. Similarly, in our own situation, you can have whipping up of emotions uh, under the guise of and inspired by what are sound, radical sounding slogans. And at the end of the day, the radical sounding slogan doesn't in any way match the reality of uh, the actual delivery that will take place to the constituency that is actually being rallied. So I think in the more recent times you've heard uh, some articulate radical economic transformation in a particular way and you've had others articulating it in a very different way. And the others, are me amongst them, so let me confess that, although we're not with the Pope or anything like that, uh, <laughs> would be amongst those who are arguing that economic transformation must be for the benefit of all 50 million people in South Africa. The others would actually articulate it in a way in which it's designed to mislead people that if we do 
these extremely so-called radical things, uh, they would benefit, but ultimately it's a small elite that actually benefits as well. And that's going to be a part of the contestation that takes place in South Africa around, around those sorts of issues. Now, I've just pinpointed these seven or eight phenomena of what could constitute a new way of thinking about the political economy uh, in, in the future. But amongst those issues that the new political economy uh, must address is firstly, uh, how do we tackle the problem of inequality, inclusion and accountability? Because those work together. Where you have lack of accountability, where you have lack of transparency, where you have lack of discipline, because the law is unable to implement, uh, impose its discipline uh, within a particular situation, then you have inequality growing and exclusion of people from the benefits of society and economic growth increasing. And that's the phenomenon in many ways that, that we actually have to uh, overcome. The second uh, key element, uh, as Atkinson and Piketty have said, is what does it mean to actually start crafting policy with inequality at the heart <coughs> of a new policy agenda? So that the vast majority of people who find themselves at the other end uh, of the economic scale are in fact the subjects and the beneficiaries of new policies, new <coughs> programs, and the way in which national resources are actually spent. Now what this also then requires uh, to the economists amongst us, so Mike, I'm sure you've still got energy for this, is to start developing new models which both transform existing uh, economies and restructure them so they're more dynamic, more competitive, uh, more able to cope with the trends that are happening in this globalized world. But at the same time, in the South African context, what it means is that the high levels of exclusion which apartheid inspired must be reversed, and reversed as a matter of urgency so that everybody feels and experiences being part of uh, the economic stakes that are, that are actually involved. So what is the new model that will reduce inequality, that will increase inclusive growth, that will transform our economy in every sense of the word that we talk about and, and lead to a different kind of economic uh, narrative and model as, as we go into, into, into the future. The third issue that clearly the new political economy must look at, as I pointed out earlier on, is the new forms of social safety nets that are going to be required in order to compensate for the damaging effects of globalization and particularly the large number of losers that globalization actually involves. The fourth is, uh, somebody put in urbanization into the title, but that's not an unimportant important element. The way cities are designed, uh, particularly in our context, and I'll come back to this in a moment, actually determines whether you are a beneficiary of the way the, the economy works in, in the large cities, uh, or even smaller ones, uh, for you or not for you. So uh, those who have studied the city of London, for example, I'm sure many of you have been there, if not all of you. Uh, for every tube station that you move from the center, uh, on the central line, from the center of the city eastwards, that's where the Olympic Stadium used to be, as you part e past each uh, tube station, the level of uh, inequality increases. Uh, so that's an interest interesting match between the spatial arrangement of a city, who lives where, and the extent to which they are exposed to opportunity, <coughs> economic opportunities or not as a result of the way cities are actually designed. Now, how much more does this apply uh, in our context where the apartheid city is still a dominant space form and where we've done very little for all sorts of reasons uh, to actually close the spatial gap between if you like, our past and our, our present in some ways. So the question is, what does all this mean for, for South Africa? Firstly, it clearly means that we do require a, uh, an urgent transformation program that will change the structure of our economy, meaning our economy needs to be more diverse, it needs to be more dynamic, it needs to be more innovative, it needs to find new areas in which we could compete with the world, uh, and export to the world as well, whilst at the same time, it needs to be restructured in order to be 
more inclusive of, of all sections of our people uh, and overcome the problem of the huge level of concentration that we actually have in our economy. Secondly, inequality is a serious issue. We are amongst the most unequal countries in the world. And uh, I've said this often enough in my earlier comments, but far greater urgency needs to be applied and greater creativity to how we uh, overcome uh, the problem of inequality. Thirdly, all of us need to, uh, it's not just the politics and the economics that matters, it's also the social dynamic in our society that matters as well. Because we are a nation in the making. And however much we think we're making a miserable job of it, ask anybody who's looked at us from outside the country, including ourselves who sit outside for a few weeks, and then marvel at how good South Africa is. There's a lot of hard work to do, but uh, part of that hard work is to continue to inspire amongst younger generations and in fact all people the values and principles in our constitution. The values of non-racialism, the values of non-sexism, particularly in the current climate where women and children are the subjects of such violent attacks that we see in, in our society. But equally, uh, the principle of the rule of law, that uh, nobody is above the law and all of us should be subjected to uh, the constitutional framework in, in which uh, we find ourselves. We've got to create, within our own situation, uh, you know, those graphs that uh, Mr. Schuster pointed are, can start moving towards 3% and 4% and 5% growth. But if that growth still benefits uh, a small number of people, it doesn't take us anywhere. There was uh, some article that I read which said that uh, eight individuals, who obviously are multi-billionaires, have as much wealth as 50% of the world population globally. Now, that's a hell of a concentration of wealth. So, growing inclusively and what giving it actual content and meaning uh, is, is, is obviously a, a, a key, key issue. The fifth is, let us all, you, you've heard us talk about connecting the dots. What does that refer to? It's a terrible class, this, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's going to be a lot of news that has been around for the last week or so, and there's going to be more. Uh, as South African Council of Churches said last Thursday, in the next week or so, let us all tune our minds to this phenomenon called state capture. What does it mean? How does it operate? Who are the beneficiaries? What are we being deprived of as a society and as a country? Where's this money going? And connecting the dots means understand the holistic nature of this particular phenomenon and don't just see things in their isolated fragments, see them in connection with each other so that we can understand some kind of picture of this phenomenon called, called state, catch, state capture and the kind of uh, damage that it is actually doing. Um, corruption is a, is a serious issue. Uh, you can see what's going on in Brazil at the moment, for example. Uh, the people who killed, kicked out, not killed, kicked out President Rousseff are themselves now, uh, half of them are in jail, half of them are being accused of corruption. And uh, in our own situation, unless we change A, the, the, the inclusive character of the economy, B, get a new moral authority into our country, uh, both from civil society and uh, from other ranks of society as well, and C, uh, point out very clearly to people engaged in corruption that there are going to be consequences for what they actually are involved in. And at the moment, there's very few consequences. Uh, we, we're going to move dangerously close to becoming a kleptocratic state. And that is not where we want to go. That's not the legacy uh, that Mr. Mandela and others have actually uh, left for us. So in conclusion, we have a great country to look after. We've got to keep reminding ourselves each morning that we get up, this is my country. It doesn't belong to one family living somewhere. This is my country. I have a stake in it. I have a stake in ensuring that it remains true to the constitution of this country. And all of us need to become active in one way or another to ensure that the sovereignty of our country, which was hard won and hard fought for, 
is something that we keep in our hands as the people of South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you.